All right, so third and last lecture about pairings. Here we're going to look into what elliptic curves have efficiently computable pairings. And then you can choose to either scale up your uh, arguments like the pimes that you're using in order to have secure pairings. Remember that I have shown you pairings as one of the rows in this table about key sizes. Or you can choose to use this as an attack tool if somebody has not actually scaled up the attack that the p sizes and is then using um, such elliptic curves as if they were normal elliptic curves and well you as the attacker notice that you have such a tool ahead. So the definition I want to give you first is that of a super singular curve. Now you need not uh, you must not confuse this with a singular curve. This is something we had in the definition of elliptic curves. An elliptic curve is a non-singular curve, but super singular is a different property. So super singular is kind of a special elliptic curve. Most elliptic curves are ordinary, and only some very special curves are super singular. Now for this lecture, I'm going to look at elliptic curves in a bit more generality, not just over FP, but over more general fine fields FQ. So this Q is some P to the R, some prime power there. And of course, uh, FP is a special case for R equals 1. So the definition of E being super singular that I want to give you is related to the number of points on this curve over FQ. So if you're looking at an elliptic curve defined over FQ, and then, well, you know from the Hasse interval, the number of points is somewhere around the size of the fine field, so Q plus 1. And then there is the extra term minus t. And you know that this minus t lives between minus 2 square root of p and plus 2 square root of p. All right, now the definition of super singular is taking this t, this offset from q plus 1, and the definition of super singularity is that e is super singular if this t is congruent to 0 mod p. So for example, this curve that I'm showing here, I'm claiming it has p plus 1 points. So it's a curve over fp where p is congruent to 3 mod 4. Well, okay, if it has p plus 1 points, then obviously this t is 0, and if it's 0, it's also 0 mod p. Okay, so if it has p plus 1 point, it is super singular. So let's see why this curve should have p plus 1 points. And well, this will use that p is congruent to 3 mod 4. But let's first look at when this right hand side is zero. So when we're looking at this right hand side, well, it could be that this part is zero, that happens for x equals zero, or that this part is zero. So if x is plus or minus the square root of minus a4, if those are defined. So I mean, if minus a4 has a square root over fp, then those give you extra points. So each of those points has the x coordinate just stated and then zero because these are roots of the right hand side. So this is 1, 0 equals that. And now comes the part where it matters that p is congruent to 3 mod 4. And that will be work for p congruent to 1 mod 4. Namely, when you're taking the um, right hand side here and you're plugging in x or minus x, then this x squared term plus a4, that doesn't change. It's exactly the same. What changes is the first part, that is either x or minus x. Well, and if you have that p is congruent to 3 mod 4, the one thing that you should always think if somebody gives you this restriction is that minus 1 doesn't have a square root over those fields. So for instance, if you're looking at the final field with seven elements, there's none of the elements squares to 6. Same holds for all larger fields like f11 and so on. So if p is congruent to 3 mod 4, then minus 1 is not a square. And so if you're asking for which x do produce a y squared, well, for each pair of x and minus x, this value is exactly the negative of each other. So for one value, it gives 2 points, and for other, it gives 0 points. So this is where the p congruent to 3 mod 4 comes in. Okay, so if we sum those up, so we I, for the first three points for the roots, we're having one point per x. For the other points, for the other x coordinates, we're having them pairwise, x and minus x, they come together, and one of them gives two points, the other gives zero. 
So on average, it's again exactly one point per x. So we're having p different uh, x coordinates. And so on average, each of them gives you one point. So we're having a total of p points where the x coordinate is at p. And then, of course, we have this point to infinity. OK, well, that is the p plus one points that we're looking for. So this curve is super singular because it has p plus one points. And here's another example. Now we're going for p being congruent to 2 mod 3. So this is a curve uh, y squared equals x cubed plus a6. So there's no x term here. And then I'm also claiming that it has p plus one points. The proof is, is pretty similar. Um, what you're using is that this implies that there are no cube roots of unity. Um, that means that the um, for each element, there's an exact there's exactly one cube root. So if you're looking at this curve and you're moving the a6 over to here, you're looking at y squared minus a6, then for each y term, you're getting, well, one extra. And so, well, you're plugging in for each of the p-values of y, you're getting one point. And so you're again having p points with e, y and fp, and then you're getting the point infinity. So in another case, we're having p plus one point. And so these are the two stereotypical super singular curves for large finite fields. So p congruent to 3 mod 4 is the first example, and for 2 mod 3 it's the second example. But you can cook up other examples. Now, I defined in the first lecture this notion of embedding degree. So that remind you was the smallest k so that L, the group order, divides p to the k minus 1. Okay, let's take one step back. We now have introduced super singular curves and also the super singular curves were related to the number of points. So let's see whether we can make some statements about the embedding degrees for super singular curves. And let me start by something which we can easily prove, namely super singular curves over large finite fields. So in particular, I'm looking at p being larger than 5, or larger than equal to 5. And 5 is the cutoff so that p is larger than 2 times square root of p or also known as square root of p is larger than 2. So then Husserl's theorem says that the bound on t is less than 2 times q. Well, q is now p here, and so this is a bound on 2 times p. So that's exactly this bound. And so if t is congruent to 0 mod p, well, there's 0, and then there's p, and there's minus p. But p and minus p are outside this interval that t can assume. So the only possible value for t being 0 mod p is that t is 0 itself. So super singular curves over larger finite fields, well, um, over prime fields, p being larger than 5, for those I requ uh, the requirement for the, the equivalence is super singular means it's p plus 1 point. And then, well, I was talking about embedding degrees being the integers, well, what k do I need for the subgroups to be in fp to the k star, then one thing to observe is that p plus 1, the number of points here, is a divisor of p square minus 1. So whatever l I have from the first group, so the first group is a subgroup of e of fp, um, that l divides p plus 1, because Lagrange, and so the same L will also divide p squared minus 1. So the embedding degree, I mean, it can be smaller than it, but the embedding degree cannot be larger than 2. So it's possible that you have some very special L, say L is 2. You shouldn't use 2 as your group size, but if you would be using 2 as your group size, the embedding degree would be just 1. But for any L that divides p plus 1, L does divide p squared minus 1. So as soon as you have a super singular curve over a large prime field, you know that the pairing, uh, that the embedding degree is no larger than 2. OK, so, well, learn something. Remember this row in the table. So if you're encountering such a curve and you want to balance the sizes, and we're in this column with 128 bits, you need that your group size of the curve, so this L is 256 bit, and then the final field size is at least 3072 bits. So, well, that's kind of a unhappy 
match because, well, this group can be much smaller than the p to the k. But, well, we have this p to the k, we have to reach um, 3000 something, so the p has to be at least 1000 something, 1500 for pairings on these groups. Now, I have mentioned distortion maps in the context of this BLS signatures, and actually for these particular super singular curves, we do have efficient distortion maps. We also have efficient maps to hash to the curve. I, I don't specify them here, but distortion maps, let's look at those. So we want to have a map from G1, which is the points over FP, to G2, which are points over FP squared of order L. And, well, not the same as the points over FP. And so phi for this first curve for the x cubed plus ax or the plus a4x, um, there we can use that i, the square root of minus 1, doesn't exist over fp, so this is definitely a point in the extension field. And when you run through these points, you see that these are points of order L. And these are kind of nice for arithmetics. So if you think of Montgomery letters, and if you're doing, say, scalar multiplication, Montgomery letters are very attractive. The exponent is just over the fine field fp, not over fp squared. And while the y coordinate is just a pure fp squared element, so it's just times y uh, times i, so you might also be able to do some maps there. But we don't even need to care about this because you have this distortion map, so you can just compute in g1, take the result, map it to g2. Similarly, for the second curve, well, there is said that we don't have roots, a uh, cube root of unity over fp in the case that p is going to 2 mod 3 and so we take an e non-trivial cube root as j and then here we have our distortion map. You can verify that these points are over the fine field, uh, sorry, are over the curve. So if you're taking this point and you're cubing this one, well you're having minus x cubed, you're having minus a4x and the i times y gives you a minus 1 here as well. So if xy was on the curve, then also phi of xy is on the curve. And then similar over here. This is even easy to see because you have a cube root of unity. It just goes in the x part, turns into 1 when you cube it. And so for xy on the original curve, jxy is on the twisted, uh, it's on the uh, g2 curve. So the nice part is you can use them for BLS signatures, but as I warned you, you need p of 1500 bits and up. Then we have seen an example of this actually. Um, remember the example I gave you in the DLP lectures, the curve that we've been breaking every which way. So this was a particularly bad choice of curves. We have already seen that while well, it didn't even have the full group order in a cyclic group, we lost a factor of two there. And then we noticed that this 500 well, was a curve over a million three having a million four points which is, means that it's a super singular curve, it's exactly p plus 1. We have also seen that this curve is very, very weak under Pauli Hellman because 500,002 splits these with the power, this was 2 times 53 squared times 89, so we have broken this with Pauli Hellman in, in much less time. And now we see another way to attack it, namely by using pairings. Because this is a super singular curve, we have an efficient pairing, and we have this distortion map. So we in constructing our extension of fp as adjoining the square root of minus 1, so i. Then we have this distortion of our uh, base field here. Now, I'm confusing myself a little bit at the numbers here because, well, p and i should just, oh, that, sorry, this is, this is, minus p of course this is these numbers together um, eight plus yeah four plus nine is three so these two add up to a million three so we're having x y here would be uh, hundred and one thousand this point is x y and then here we're having minus x y times i sorry um, and then finally we compute the pairings so when we're plugging in the base point with the uh, distorted point and compute the pairing of this. Well, I asked my computer for the veil pairing and it gave me this number. This is an element of fp squared. And I also did the same on the target curve. And then, well, 
these are small enough that I can just search for it or can use baby step, giant step and so on. And we have solved this already, but I can also solve it with index calculus attack there. And the index calculus attack is an attack that scales really, really nicely. And index calculus in FP squared is a lot easier than a normal discrete log in FP. Whether it is easier in this case is a different story because, well, this group order is, is highly composite. And so actually uh, doing the attack on the, uh, on the group side in this case is easier. But if I would fix that by choosing a group which has prime order or almost prime order, it would still be a bad example in that um, if I would fix it to have a group order which is almost prime but still has p plus one point. So by choosing a different prime so that actually that would give me an almost prime number, then I would still have the pairing as an attack. To get all parts of the lecture together, this is actually the same example that we have seen with the clock. So when I did the clock group, I also had an example of p plus one curve points over a million three, and that is exactly what is happening here with these i, well, you have to flip x, y to make it work. So final slide, um, embedding degrees for other curves. I said in this lecture, we're also looking at uh, larger fine fields, so not just FP, but also FQ. And then super singularity gives you a bit more flexibility. So for um, just prime fields, I showed you that the embedding degree is no larger than two. Um, but for other fine fields, you have a bit more flexibility just because your T can take other values. So if you have, for instance, a binary field, so power of two, FP to the two to the R, then you can have that K is up to four and there exists curves where the embedding degree is four. So that's because your Hus interval then is large enough that also two, uh, sorry, that P is in there. So T being P, sorry, T being P or two P even can fit if you're looking at sufficiently large extension degrees. But you will not see anything larger than K equals four. For characteristic three, so P is three, and then R is large in order to get anything anywhere decent uh, with discrete log security. Um, in that case, you can have embedding degree up to six, but none of the super singular curves can ever have a larger embedding degree. Now the paper I'm citing here from Menezes, Okamoto and Vanstone, that is actually an attack paper saying you should not use super singular curves for cryptography because these pairings give you a transfer from the discrete log problem in the uh, original curve to a fine field, and it's much, much easier to solve on the fine field side. Now, historically, there were some more papers afterwards saying, ooh, 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 I noticed some attack example. Here are some other curves which also have small and abandoning degrees while they are ordinary. And yes, uh, it's an implication in one way. If it's a super singular curve, the embedding degree cannot be larger than four. And in typical case that you would be looking at not even larger than two. But it doesn't mean that if you have an ordinary curve that it can't happen. It won't happen to your randomly chosen curve. So if your P and K, sorry, if your P and L are in some random position, I mean P is about the same size as L, then normally the order of P mod L is about the size of L. I said this already when I motivated the embedding degree. So normally the embedding degree is very, very large. So you have to put in a lot of effort to construct curves where the embedding degree is smaller. But since people liked uh, pairing-based protocols, there are now a few designs where you have an intermediate size um, embedding degree. So the well most famous example or most useful example is the barretto nerich curves, and those have embedding degree 12. And so those are curves that were designed for the current level of security, so 128-bit security, where you have that the elliptic curve group has 256 bits, and then that times 12 nicely lands you exactly at the 3072, where you want to be with your fine field discrete log. Now, when I was talking about discrete log uh, index calculus applications, I said there has been some progress in attacking uh, these intermediate fields. So if you have some prime field with E, extension degree, and in particular if this is a composite number, so you're having this uh, p to the 12 here, 
the attacks have gotten somewhat more powerful and so the recommendations are actually that the end curves do not quite give you 128-bit security anymore because that fine field can be more powerful attacked than a arbitrary field of that size but it is still about the best we can do. So there are many more proposals, um, there are also more recent papers, not just be in curves but also other curves that have embedding degrees which are larger than 12 or are dealing with cofactors, are pumping up the P. So there's a there's a whole possible machinery. So if you're interested in pairings, it's still sort of active research area. Um, and it's also relation to standardization level. So C over G, for instance, is discussing um, some standards related to pairings. On the other hand, it's also a little bit exotic. It has, well, more knobs to turn than we normally have in crypto. And depending on your application, you might just be happy with a normal discrete block problem.